Good evening, and welcome to the Chatham Marconi Speaker Series. My name is Liz McCart, and I am a volunteer here. We welcome you to the last speaker series of the year. As a reminder, you can ask questions during the presentation by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. You type in your question, and at the end of the presentation, our speaker will answer as many questions as possible. There are many stories of heroism and bravery in World War II. The undertold story is that of the vital and critical role that the Merchant Marines played in sailing tons of cargo and supplies across the seas to our allies. Our speaker tonight, Bill Giroux, will honor the Merchant Marines by telling their story. It is my privilege to introduce Bill. Bill wrote for the Richmond Times Dispatch for 25 years. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, Associated Press, and various regional magazines. He has written two books about the World War II convoys and the merchant mar marines who sailed in them, The Matthews Men and The Ghost Ships of Archangel. The Matthews Men was chosen by Amazon as one of the best books of 2016, making the overall top 100 list as well as the top 20 list in the biography and memoir categories. And I can say personally, having read those books, they are excellent. Um, so with that, uh, Bill, who is a native of Washington, DC and a graduate of the College of William and Mary, um, I'm going to turn the presentation over to you. Well, great, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Liz, for inviting me and thank you all for, for tuning in. Um, I, uh, I live in Virginia Beach, but I, I am in Cape Cod for at least a few days every summer. And right now I have a friend from Cape Cod staying with me on his annual pilgrimage down to, uh, down to the Florida Keys. So I, uh, I'm very glad to, to be joining you all here today. Um, I'd like to talk a little about the, the a part of the war that a lot of Americans, World War II, that a lot of Americans don't really know very much about, if anything. Um, the, I think this group here may know more than most, but I'll, uh, so I'll try to split the difference. During World War II, and to a lesser extent, World War I, German U-boats preyed on shipping. On, they, they basically con controlled parts of our coastline. They sank more than 400 American merchant ships, and they killed thousands of American mariners or various allied mariners. This was... Uh, the Germans took advantage of our general unreadiness for war, and particularly by our, our Navy's uh, slow response. And the, um, it took almost seven months to mount an effective defense by us against U-boats right along our coastline. And by then, the, uh, the United States had suffered what one historian called a, uh, an Atlantic Pearl Harbor all this was a, uh, although it was a, a kind of a slow moving for Pearl Harbor that it seems even more likely we might've been able to, uh, to prevent or at least slow down. Um, we should have known this was coming and I'm gonna use a, a screen share here, I think to try to share some, some uh, slides with you that I, help, I think will help illustrate what I'm, uh, what I'm talking about. If you'll bear with me for just a second. Um, we should have known what they were going to do because they had done it in World War I. In the final months of World War I, they had U-boats uh, had come from Germany to, uh, it was too late really in the war for them to have much impact on the war, but they came over from Germany and raised a lot, caused a lot of trouble in a short time with uh, attacks on, on ships along the coast. And one of those attacks, as you can see here, is a, uh, uh, was one off Orleans, just uh, three miles offshore. They attacked uh, some, some manned uh, barges, and they sank one of them and injured some people. Uh, they were, the U-boat was finally driven off by planes from Chatham Naval Air Station. So since they had done this in World War 
One, it stood to reason that they would do it again in World War II, but we, uh, and they did. The, the U-boat's prime target, their main purpose was to sink merchant ships. They would sink warships when the opportunity presented itself, but mainly they were after the merchant ships because they knew that the merchant ships, the freighters and tankers, were the, the supply line for the allies overseas. And if uh, Hitler knew that if the United States could, could keep projecting its industrial power and manpower and, and economic power across the ocean to Europe, that the Germans would lose the war. And of course, that's exactly what ended up happening. But the U-boats gave it a good shot. They torpedoed ships, American ships, right off our shoreline. Uh, they torpedoed them really everywhere in the, in the European theater of the war. Uh, on the convoy routes to England, the, um, on the, down in the, the South Atlantic, off Cape Town, off Brazil, in the Mediterranean, in the Arctic. One of my books is about a, uh, an allied convoy trying to fight its way across the Arctic to deliver supplies to the Soviet Union, which was our very, very shaky ally in, in the war against Nazi Germany. Uh, but mainly the U-boats did their business right on our coastlines. They sank ships with enormous loss of life in the Gulf of Mexico, right at the mouth of the Mississippi River. Uh, they sank them all up and down our East Coast. This is the oil tanker Dixie Arrow going down in flames off uh, Cape Hatteras, which was one of their, the U-boat's favorite, favorite haunts. But the U-boats were all up and down the coast. They, uh, one U-boat commander wrote in his memoirs about seeing the Coney Island Ferris wheel from his conning tower. The U-boats used the, the lights of our coastal cities. Uh, we didn't want to dim them. And they used the, the glow of coastal cities like uh, Miami or Norfolk or you know, any, anywhere really to, uh, to help find targets. The, the merchant ships would sail at night with all their lights out so they wouldn't be seen. So the U-boats would sit seaward of the shipping lanes and wait for the ships to pass in front of the glow of these lights. And it would silhouette them like ducks in a shooting gallery. And this went on for really for six or seven months at the beginning of the war. The, I, I will, I'll show you, give you an idea of what, of this is a, a, a just a quick map, the committed, concocted by the Navy showing all the merchant ship sinkings in the, uh, in the European theater between Pearl Harbor and the, the end of June, 1942. And as you can see, you don't have to look very closely to see that a lot of them are right along our coast and in the Caribbean, which was another trouble spot. This got so bad in late 1942 that a publisher of Merchant Mariner's textbooks hurried into print a skinny little volume called How to Abandon Ship. And this was just like it sounded. It was a little primer about how to avoid getting killed when your ship was torpedoed. And it was uh, had instructions for what do you take in a lifeboat? When is the time, when is it time to get in a lifeboat? You know, how do you get in a lifeboat? And even had a section about how to survive if you were marooned on a deserted island in the Arctic, because again, we were sailing in the Arctic. And one subsection of that really caught my eye. It was how to kill and eat a polar bear before the polar bear kills and eats you. And I was so intrigued by it that I, I'll tell you, you shoot a polar bear right behind the shoulder blades because you're sure to kill him, pierce his heart. You do not shoot him in the water if you plan to eat him because he's too heavy. You're not gonna be able to drag him out. If you get him out and are positioned to eat him, you're gonna to have to eat that polar bear raw because he's too, totally too tough if he's cooked. And it also said that no matter how hungry you are, never to eat the polar bear's liver because as I learned later, the polar bear is liver is just so, has such a concentration of vitamin A that it will, uh, it will make you sick. Um, for the first six or seven months of the war, these ships were getting 
sunk so much because they were sailing virtually unprotected. The Navy, uh, in fairness, did not have a lot of ships and the Army Air Forces did not have a lot of planes to keep flying along our coast to, to protect these ships that were constantly going up and down. But it's also true that the Navy, and particularly Admiral Ernest King, who was the operational head of the Navy, didn't really want to use his destroyers, you know, his warships to be babysitting, basically babysitting these slow moving merchant ships up and down the coast. He wanted these destroyers out hunting U-boats, you know, seeking them out. And it took us a very long time to figure out that the U-boats had come 3,000 miles to sink merchant ships. And that if a, you wanted to put in a destroyer into combat with a U-boat, the surest way to do it was to have the destroyer in close company of merchant ships. One of the things that we were doing right was what was being done here. And I don't know a great deal about the Marconi uh, operation there, but all along our coast, we had radio stations that would intercept transmissions from U-boats. Every day, the U-boats were required to check in with the, with the main office, if you will, to, uh, and report what they were doing. And this was all done in the, uh, in the Enigma code, which the Germans thought was unbreakable, but which had been broken, or which was intermittently, but for the most part, broken. But it was the radio transmissions were helpful even when they, the messages couldn't be broken or they couldn't be broken in time to make them something you could act on because just the transmissions, if three different stations picked it up, you could, you could pinpoint the location of the U-boat. So at least it told you where the U-boat was. Without any protection from any protection, a, a, an encounter between a merchant ship and a U-boat a contest was really no contest at all. A lot of these uh, merchant ships were, some of them were brand new. We were producing these things just as fast as we could. We were building shipyards to produce them. So a lot of ships sailing were these brand new Liberty ships. But many of the ships sailing, particularly in the first year that we were in the war, were ships like this. This is the, sorry, <laughs> Over here. Okay. This is the SS Troubadour. The Troubadour is a freighter, an American freighter. The Troubadour was built um, for World War I, and it had spent the intervening years as a tramp steamer. So it was basically hauling whatever cargo its agents could book to whatever point on the globe the customer wanted it taken. Now, that's hard duty for a, uh, a merchant ship. And by World War II, the Troubadour had seen better days and the people that, ser that served on it referred to it routinely as a rust bucket. Um, they, uh, it had also been an Italian crew had attempted to sabotage it too. So it was in rough shape. The, so, so we had a combination of, of ships like this and brand new ones. The, pe the men on these ships were Navy men, and also civilian merchant mariners. The Navy men, most of them were, uh, many of them anyway, were these idealistic young guys who had signed up maybe right after Pearl Harbor, wanted to strike a blow. And I'm sure that many of them pictured themselves on the decks of mighty warships trading thundering salvos in the Pacific with the Japanese, with the, with the fate of the, the Pacific War in the balance. But these guys instead ended up in something called the Navy Armed Guard. And the Armed Guard was a little sliver of the Navy that had been organized to produce gun crews for the guns that were being hurriedly installed, retrofitted on old ships like the Troubadour here. Now, through no fault of these Navy guys, the gun crews, putting guns on an old merchant ship was not an effective way to protect it. And uh, particularly some of the guns they were putting on, a gun on uh, one of the ships in one of the convoys I write about was, uh, was brought out of retirement from a city park in Baltimore. So that was the, those were the armaments we were putting on the ships. So the, within the Navy, service in the armed guard was not considered a desirable 
posting. It was a, considered a good way to get killed. And the, the armed guards official motto was, we aim to deliver, meaning we aim at the bad guys so the ship can get through and deliver the cargo. But the unofficial motto of the Navy armed guard was sighted sub glove glove. The, merch, the civilian merchant mariners, the guys who sailed these ships were very much a mixed bag. Many of them were veterans, old salts who had sailed the oceans for years and even decades. Some of them had sailed in World War I and they were capable and tough and they really knew their business. There were also a sprinkling of younger guys, the patriotic guys often who were, who for some reason couldn't get into the military. But every merchant crew seemed to have a few kind of sketchy characters aboard. And to give you an example on the troubadour here, one of my main characters in my books, Jim North, he's not a sketchy character, but as soon as he got on the troubadour, one of the biggest, meanest guys on the crew grabbed Jim by the hair and started banging his head into the deck of the ship just for amusement. And this went on until an even bigger and meaner guy came along and punched the first guy. And the two brawlers exchanged, you know, wore themselves out, fought to a draw, shook hands with each other. And then as a afterthought, turned and shook hands with Jim. And it was in this way that Jim North made his first two friends aboard the Troubadour. Another ship that I write about, the Ironclad, had in its crew a washed up ex-prize fighter who everyone called the kid, who would obey orders only if someone occasionally hit him over the head with a rifle butt and knocked him unconscious. So these were the kind of the men in the ships that we had out there sailing. It was, uh, it was quite a combination. They were going against the U-boats. This is a U-boat. It is uh, plowing through the Atlantic with a, um, with a merchant ship in the background. U-boats were ship sinking machines, but they have sort of a mystique about them as this, oh, this perfect weapon. There are all sorts of uh, groups fascinated in U-boats. But what I try to show in some of my books is that U-boats were really, uh, they were really vessels with a lot of weaknesses and vulnerabilities. They weren't even, submarines at all the way we think of submarines today you know the uh, the nuclear subs that can stay underwater for months at a time u-boats were really surface vessels they did everything better on the surface but when necessary they could shift over from their powerful diesel engines to battery power kind of like a, a, a prius and stay underwater for brief periods of time usually a, a number of hours a few hours to either to get in position for a surprise attack or to elude pursuers. But most of the ships that hunted U-boats were faster and better armed than they were. And they were, if a U-boat could be spotted, could be detected by sonar and trapped underwater and spotted and attacked with depth charges, which were cylind large cylinders of explosives that were shot off the ship and timed to explode at preset depths. So you would guess how deep you wanted the, you thought the U-boat was. And if you were close enough that, and the depth charge exploded close enough to the U-boat, it could crack the hull like an eggshell and probably kill every man aboard. Life in a U-boat was brutal. The air was foul. The food was, was got rancid pretty quickly. The U-boat was so cramped that men literally had to sleep on top of torpedoes, which were stored under their bunks. And all of the U-boat's the operating systems were very unforgiving. They had to, had to be done just right, or it could mean disaster. And I cite one example in the book where a, an improperly flushed toilet resulted in a U-boat sinking. But U-boats were, they were a ship killing machines. They were, had, were armed to the teeth. They had their signature weapons, the torpedoes. And a lot of them had, had these fearsome deck cannons mounted on the foredeck. And these things were powerful enough to sink merchant ships 
and without even the the captain having to spend a precious torpedo, uh, they were especially effective if they could be put in a place where there were lots of targets and very weak defenses. The head of the U-boat command, Admiral Carl Dunitz, was a master at constantly shifting his U-boats around into to put them in position to, to take advantage of the weak points in the Allied um, supply line. And for much of the first year that we were in the war, the weakest point by far was the uh, coastline of the United States. This next photo um, I've included to give you a sense of what it was like to be a merchant mariner or a, a Navy armed guard guy and be on a ship attacked by a U-boat and try to escape with your life. You had to run a, a gauntlet of perils. The, um, the, 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 this is the a Liberty ship, the Thomas McKean, being attacked by a U-boat. It's already been torpedoed by the U-boat and now the U-boat is pummeling it with its deck cannon. Um, the, the, this photo, by the way, is taken from the U-boat. The U-boats often had propaganda photographers riding along with them to show the, show the folks back home or, or wherever the, the, the damage they were wreaking. So if you were on the, if you were a mariner on a ship under attack, very often that attack by a U-boat would come in the dead of night, no warning. And a lot of the guys who died on these ships never even got out of their quarters. The torpedo blasted a hole in the hull, the water started rushing in, the, the explosion maybe set the cargo on fire. These guys never, they were just, they just went down and were entombed with the ship. If you did get out onto the main deck when the attack, you know, after the attack started, or if you were on watch, of course, the, when the attack occurred, you would be, might be part of a scene like this here. The U-boat uh, might still be shooting at you. The uh, ship might be on fire. The, uh, uh, the deck might, the ship might be listing really steeply. The deck, you know, very difficult to stand on nearly impossible to launch a lifeboat under these circumstances, even if you've practiced it, you know, if the deck is, if the deck is uh, listing like that. So you are, um, the, the, the sea might be rough, it might be freezing cold, it might be full of sharks, it might even be on fire, because if an oil tanker was sunk, or if a ship was sunk that had a, a, a cargo, a, a flammable cargo, or even if the ship's uh, oil bunkers were, were pierced by the attack, the fuel would often spill out over the sea around the ship. It would float and it would ignite and create sort of a flaming moat around the sinking ship. And any man who jumped off the, uh, this ship to try to save his life and landed in that would be would be severely burned if not, if not killed outright. If you did manage to get to a lifeboat, your problems might just be beginning because lifeboats in the 1940s aren't like lifeboats today, like in Captain Phillips, or you've probably seen some there. They are, they're designed to right themselves. They're very self-contained. Lifeboats in the 1940s were sturdy, but they were open boats. And if you were in one, you were subject to all the elements, the sea spray, the rain, sleet, snow, the cold, the broiling heat of the sun. And the lifeboat might or might not have all the, the water and the food that it was supposed to be carrying. And you might be in the lifeboat for days or weeks or even months. Some of these lifeboats drifted literally for thousands of miles across open ocean with the occupants just hoping that they would be lucky enough to, to cross paths with a, with a ship that would rescue them or that they would crunch ashore on a, uh, an island someplace where they could, where they, they could get somebody to, you know, to give them help. Um, so it, was a, it, it really was a gauntlet of dangers you had to go through. And a lot of these men didn't survive them. There were 9,300 merchant mariners killed in World War II at a higher really percentage than, than any branch of the military. Only the U.S. Marines uh, really came close. But a lot of these men did survive. 
they, they would go through sinkings. And this sinking here, the, the Thomas McKean, is the, is the second of three ships to be sunk out of a, out from under a merchant sea captain that I wrote about from Matthews County, Virginia. His name was well, Mellon Respus. And Mellon survived the first sinking, the one before this, pretty well. He got in a lifeboat, got rescued fairly quickly. This one, the Thomas McKean, he survived it as well, but he was injured and he had to spend weeks in a hospital. And when he finally recuperated enough to be, to be sent home to go back to Matthews for a while to recuperate, he arranged to get a ride on a friend's ship. And that ship on its way back to the United States was torpedoed. This happened to a lot, of, a lot of men. A lot of them were torpedoed multiple times. I have mentioned a guy in the book who was torpedoed 10 times uh, between World War I and World War II. One of the things that really struck me about the research was how many encounters there were between U-boat captains and the survivors of the boats that they sank. This is a uh, photo taken again from a U-boat. You can see the, the railing of the U-boat in the foreground. And in the background, there's uh, some men on a raft. And this often happened that after a U-boat would sink a merchant ship, a freighter, a tanker, the U-boat would surface and there would be discussion and discourse and exchange. Usually what the Germans wanted was information. They would, they would, Re gesture down from the conning tower with a machine gun and pointed at these, these unlucky guys and say, and interrogate them. What was the name of your ship? What was your cargo? What was the uh, destination? What was the tonnage? That's the, the cargo capacity of a ship. So it's a, that's how the U-boats measured their success in the U-boat war. How much tonnage did we sink this week? So after the, the U-boat commanders got the answers from these men, and sometimes these men courageously lied to them, but after they got the answers, many of the U-boat guys would just, they were the U-boats would just submerge and move away and leave men like this to the mercy of the sea, which in many case, cases was no mercy at all. But a surprising number of U-boat guys that I found, after they got the answers to the questions, they would approach the lifeboats or the rafts and give the men food, water, uh, medical attention, directions to the nearest land. A couple of them offered to tow them part of the way. Uh, one of the Matthews men that I wrote about was torpedoed in the Caribbean. And right after his ship went down, the U-boat surfaced right next to it, almost capsizing the lifeboat. And everybody in that lifeboat thought, you know, this is the end. But instead, the U-boat captain first apologized to them for having had to sink their ship. He offered them food, medical attention, some, a bunch of German cigarettes, some French cookies, because the, uh, the U-boat had been based in occupied France. And he offered them finally a big jug of drinking water. And drinking water is the most precious commodity for, a, uh, for people in a lifeboat. So he gives them this big jug of drinking water, but before he hands it over, he reaches up and squeezes some fresh limes into the water. And what he's doing is trying to, for them to introduce some vitamin C into the water to help them ward off scurvy, a vitamin uh, deficiency disease that, that castaways often, often got. So it was, and as he's pulling away, he calls out to these, uh, to these men in the lifeboat, come and see me when this is all over. Come and see me in Germany when, when, this, is, when this ends. Um, another U-boat commander astonished the men in a lifeboat by asking them how the Brooklyn Dodgers were doing. The U-boat commander had uh, grown up as a, as a child in Brooklyn and was a Dodgers fan. Um, so, but I, I don't want to give you the impression that the U-boat war was some kind of clubby, chummy affair. It was really anything but. U-boat war is, warfare is among the most brutal kinds and, and uh, nothing illustrates that I don't think quite so well as this next photo. And this is 
the, all the, these photos, all the way, by the way, are in the, in the books, but they, this photo is a close up of the last photo. And what it shows is these, these that are seven men on a raft. And this, these seven men are the only ones who got off alive out of 34 men when the American oil tank, tanker Muskogee was torpedoed in the deep ocean, hundreds of miles from shore. And um, if you look at this picture, this, this uh, again, they're hundreds of miles from land. The ocean, it's March. The ocean is freezing cold. It's rough. And this raft is a, uh, it's really just a, uh, some slabs of wood nailed to some floating drums. So it's better than swimming, but it is not going to keep these guys alive for very long under those conditions. And if you look closely at them, I, it seems to me you can, that some of them already know this. A couple of them are yelling at the U-boat. A couple others are staring, but a couple are just sort of staring off into space. You know, like they've already figured out that nothing is going to save them. And nothing ever did. None of these men was ever seen again. Nobody on the Muskogee was ever seen again. The Allies didn't even know that the Muskogee had been sunk at first. Uh, it didn't, apparently didn't get off an SOS call. And it just didn't show up at the port where it was supposed to, you know, to, to come. And it was listed at first as overdue and then as missing and finally uh, presumed sunk by submarine. And that was not unusual. 33 American ships just disappeared like that in, in World War II, uh, presumably just sunk in distant corners of the ocean where the only witnesses were the, uh, were the men in the U-boats who didn't have any inclination or duty to, uh, to report it. Um, many of the, these men's uh, families, of course, most of them went to their graves without ever knowing anything uh, beyond that. Ultimately, oddly enough, the, the future of the what, or the what happened to the Muskogee did become known in a very unusual way. In the 1980s, the son of the Muskogee's captain George, a guy's named George Betts. He's a, a Mainer. He's from Maine, uh, was from. And he uh, got hold of some declassified Navy documents and figured out which U-boat had sunk the Muskogee here. Uh, he also tracked down the Muskogee's captain, the, or, or the U-boat's uh, captain. He had survived the war and was a retired businessman. And he wrote him a letter. And he wrote, I'm not angry that you killed my father. I know it was an act of war, but I would like to know what happened to the Muskogee. So the U-boat commander wrote him back a very detailed letter. And he said, yes, I sunk the Muskogee. We felt terrible about it. We gave these men on the raft uh, food and water, but we couldn't do anything else. We, uh, our U-boat was so, we could barely have enough for room for our own guys. And we were on our way to America to start our mission. So we had to leave them. You know, war is a, a terrible thing. So uh, Mr. Betts, after receiving this, tracked down uh, some family member from every single one of the men on his father's ship. And we we're down to grand nieces and, and distant cousins, but he found everybody. He went on uh, um, one of those TV shows, America's Mysteries or something like that, and got it to, to get to get help. And uh, most, he wrote him a letter and said, this is what happened. And most people were very grateful. And these letters are in a, in the archives of a, a museum in Philadelphia. And most people said, we're very grateful. They said, thank you. At least after all these years, we know something. But one of the letters that came back was a very short one from the family of Nat Foster of Matthews County. And the letter said, basically, we just don't receive, wish to receive any further information about this. So not everybody wanted to relive the horrors of the U-boat war. There are so many stories in the U-boat war that I encountered just amazing stories that, that I had never heard before and that I think a lot of people haven't heard before. Um, this, there's a story of the lifeboat baby. This is a baby that was born in a lifeboat in a storm after her mother's, uh, after his mother's ship was torpedoed off 
Cape Hatteras, there is a, a story about, about the ring. This is a gold signet ring with the initials GDH, and it belonged to a Matthews County sea captain whose ship was torpedoed off Cuba. And this ring was found soon afterwards in the, in the belly of a big shark caught in the same waters where the uh, captain's ship went down. There is a story in the book about a very resourceful ship's engineer who saved the lives of everybody in his lifeboat by cobbling together odds and ends in the lifeboat and building a still that could convert salt water to drinkable water. Um, before I stop, I would like to talk, say a little bit about what happened, what became of the Merchant Marine after the war. Um, after the war, they were not really part of the ticker tape parades, the celebrations down Broadway and other big streets. They were basically still sailing. It didn't end for them. The first thing they did was bring all the troops home. And then after that, they hauled the uh, supplies and the people over to Europe to try to build the countries that had been torn apart by the war. But while they were gone, they didn't have um, a lot of powerful friends in, the, in Washington, and they were left out of the GI Bill and the, 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 all the veterans' benefits until the 1980s, when a lot of them were too old to do, to do much about it. And part of the reason is that I think if you look at this poster, it's a, it's a recruiting poster for the Merchant Marine. And it says, you bet I'm going back to sea. And what it means is uh, in the context of, of the 1942, it's like, yes, some, you know, maybe I've been torpedoed before. Maybe a couple of my buddies have been killed or something like that, but I'm not going to quit. I'm going to get on another ship and go back out there. And which is great. And you look at this guy and he's certainly the guy you'd like to have on your side in a fight. But if you look, he also doesn't necessarily look like the kind of guy that you would want to bring home to meet your, your family or for bring him home over, you know, for Thanksgiving or Christmas. He looks a little, a little seedy, a little rough. And this was the, the Merchant Marine during the war, at least had this reputation. And I think that was a, it's a shame. It, 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 it was undeserved and it caused them uh, no end of grief. Um, there are stuff going on in Congress now to get them a medal or to get them some money. And I think they're having some success with this, but you know, that's the, most of the people I talked to, the old mariners in Matthews County were really more concerned that the, they thought the public, they want what they really wanted was not money from the government. I think they had quit expecting that, but they thought you know, some kind of, uh, you know, recognition from the public that they had actually done this because they've kind of been written out of the narrative of how we won the war, maybe not written out, but just never included. And one guy, one old mariner told me, he said, maybe when your book comes out, uh, my uh, grandfather, my grandson will finally believe I did something worthwhile during World War II. So I really hope that, uh, I really hope that that happens. Um, I will show you if you're interested in any more of these things. Sorry for the uh, for the plug, but here are here are my two uh, my two books: um, the Matthews Men, which is about a a uh, kind of a war within a war between this little seafaring community of Matthews, uh, maybe a little bit like like Chatham or, or someplace up in Massachusetts, but in Matthews County, the war within a war between this little community full of merchant mariners and the and the U-boats. And the second one, the ghost ships of Archangel is about the convoy, uh, the allied convoy that had to go through the, through the Arctic. So uh, with that, I will, uh, I will take these, these uh, slides down. And if we have time, Liz, I'd be happy to answer anybody's questions. Oh, great. Thank you, Bill. And that was um, an incredible story and the pictures were, were amazing just to be really showing the human side of it. And, and, and all merchant mariners should be thanked for that service that they provided to the country, not only during the war, but uh, subsequently, as you said, their, their job was not done once the war was done. So um, just, just an incredible story. So thank you. Um, so we do have some time for questions and, and just type them in at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we'll, um, I'll read them to, to Bill and he can answer them. We already have a couple, um, so I will start. Well, Wesley was uh, 
intrigued by the polar bears. And um, that was quite, quite something to understand what you need to do with the polar bears and what to eat and not to eat. He wants to know, um, are there records of American personnel actually eating polar bears? I did, I did not, uh, I did not, I did not see any during my research. I did find a, a, a record of a rush, some Russians, because the, we and the Germans and the Russians would all very you know, different times land parties on these remote Arctic islands, you know, for, for, I don't know, spying or radio or whatever. And there is a record that I saw of some, some Russians being plagued by polar bears and finally killing and eating one, but it didn't, uh, didn't go into any particulars about that, but it, you know, it seems like, it certainly seems like it could, certainly seems like it could have, could have happened, almost certainly did, but a, a difficult, a difficult task in any event. Yeah, and it certainly ex explains the, um, the situation, the dire circumstances when you're being instructed on how to eat a polar bear. It does. It just shows yeah, you how, I mean, bad, it's how just bad things bad. are that somebody somebody felt it necessary to include this passage in there. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, another viewer, Tony, um, comments. He has a couple of comments. Uh, he says, as an Englishman living in the USA, I salute the bravery of the merchant mariners who supplied the UK throughout the war. Well, that's uh, he right. also, yeah. certainly the British merchant mariners. I mean, the British, you know, the British merchant mariners had had much greater losses than the, I believe, than the, than the Americans did. So they had been at it for a couple of years before we really got into it. So they were, they were right in the thick of it with us in the, in the Arctic, this, my second book about the Arctic convoy, there's a, one of the heroes is a British captain of a converted fishing trawler. He, uh, they, the British were so desperate for escort ships that they put guns and depth charges on fishing trawlers and sent the, sent the fishermen out to hunt U-boats instead of cod. So yeah, well that's that's nice of him. Sorry, I'm babbling on, but I uh, that's oh. nice. well that goes to you know it's the the whole culture and environment. You take a fishing trawler and convert not just the boat, but you have to you have to almost turn those guys into to soldiers or say you know that the, they weren't trained for. So interesting. Right. Um, Tony would also like to know: Is there a memorial to the World War II merchant sailors? He understands that the DC Memorial was designed and erected for World War One. Do you know that? Yes, there's one out in uh, out in there's one at the Battery in New York. It's not a very uh, elaborate one, but there's also one in um, in California. And I, shoot, I should know this. I'm sorry, having a senior moment. I I know, uh, but there is one down in uh, San Pedro, I think, in, in California. There's there's also one. And there, there's a few scattered around. There's one in Matthews County uh, where all these, uh, the, where so many men died uh, be, from the U, during the U-boat war. So there's a map, there's a monument right in front of the courthouse uh, with all their names on it. But it's, but it's not, it's not common. Yeah, and they certainly deserve that recognition. Um, we have a comment from Captain Jack Hearn. Uh, thanks for joining us, Captain Jack. He says, great job, sir. Your research is terrific and the story is still compelling. Will you continue your work and writing on these subjects? I, um, I may. I, right now I'm working on a book about the, uh, um, uh, I tell people a, a tale of murder and may a, a, a charming tale of murder and mayhem out of all the, uh, the German POW camps that we had in the, United States during World War II. We had like 600 of them all over the country. And most people don't know much about them, but we had we had kept like almost 400,000 German POWs in the United States. So there was a, some unusual things happened with that. So I'm trying to, trying to turn that into a book, but the, the pandemic has really slowed down my, uh, my research. The National Archives is still rather tough to get into. Okay, thank you. Wesley would like to know any stories of Canadian merchant seamen during the war. Were, so were they part, were the Canadians part of some of the convoys? 
Phil. Very much so. Yeah, they. I haven't written my my stories. Haven't focused on the Canadians, but yes, they were very active, and a lot of the convoys left from uh, from Canada, so they were uh, they were uh, from Maritime Canada, and um, I have uh, I have been up there um, to. Uh, in some of these areas and they have, they have, they have amazing, there is a, uh, an officer's club in, in, uh, up there that has a, the, uh, the, a periscope from a, an old U-boat that you can, you can look through and see the, the harbor. So it's, uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff up there. And there've been, I think there's a couple of books been written about the Canadians and I've got some Canadians in my books, but they're, they're not the, you know they don't they don't happen to be the the focus of the of the stories, but yes, they were they've certainly at it. They were like the British; they were at it uh, before we were too. So they they've got a long history, and there are some. They're uh, trying to remember some of these books, but there there are a couple out there about about that. Thank you. Well, it was a world war after all, so um, most countries were impacted. Tony would like to know, were losses as bad during the period 1939 to 41 before Pearl Harbor? They were, uh, the, the British losses were tremendous. Our, our losses were, um, the Brit, we were losing some ships. The, the Germans were sinking our, some of our ships because we were, we were just blatantly uh, helping England in uh, after, after 1940, we were we were really helping them. We were sending supplies over there, and the Germans were reluctantly holding off torpedoing our ships because they didn't want us to to be part of the war. But every so often, they would torpedo one of our ships. And at first, they made much of how this had been a you know a big accident. But after a while, they just they just didn't they quit making excuses because we were. Uh, yeah, we were, well, of course, we were really pushing it. We were, we were blatantly supplying England and taking advantage of their unwillingness to, uh, their, their reluctance to get us uh, involved in the war. So it was only really a matter of time before they, before something happened that, that couldn't, that would set it off. And really the, to some people were surprised that the, the, we weren't plunged into the war in the Atlantic, that, that we were, that it, that it was Pearl Harbor that plunged us in there before, something happened with U-boats and, and ships in the, in the Atlantic, because that had been going on for, for some time. Thanks. Dave um, would like to know, how did America finally control the U-boat? In, um, in, night, in the middle of 1943, uh, we, it was like, Suddenly, we because we had been working on new technology and new strategies against the U-boats. Of course, you know since the beginning, since they caught us <laughs> off guard, and but we finally caught up with them. And we had like uh, one of the big deals was was radar that could be could be was was portable enough to put in a, a plane, so planes could attack suddenly attack U-boats on the surface where where they had been safest in, in the bad weather. And we had these uh, these hunter killer groups that would go around just just designing, to, you know, just for the purpose of of just staying with and destroying U boats because U boats their advantage had always been that in convoys the escort ships couldn't really take but so much time to to fight with them and then they had to hurry back to the convoy so there was it you know destroying U boats took time so we had the in the middle of 1943 just the combination of our new technology and tactics, uh, like a flipping a switch, turned the U-boats from the hunters into the hunted. And by the end of the war, um, it used to be at the beginning of the war that serving the U-boat force was, you know, that was the best and the brightest wanted to go there. By the end of the war, it was a suicide mission and you were, they were pulling people in off the, you know, off the young kids in off the street and saying, you're getting in a U-boat because nobody wanted to do it because it was the allies were just, we were just, we had mastered them. And they, they, they were behind in the technology. They had some things going like the snorkel and some other things, but they, we, we, 
really out uh, outsmarted them and out created them. Uh, and it was really, a, it was not one thing so much as, as it just the combination of these things just sort of finally overwhelmed them in, in about the May of 1943. And after that, the losses, uh, the losses, once we got convoys going on our shores, the losses just dropped off, like dropped, the numbers just dropped off like in a table, maybe about the latter part of 1942. And then the middle of 1943, the U-boats all over the place were, were mastered. Thank you. Dave wants to know, were all the marks on the sunken ship map, the, uh, the slide that you had with all the little dots on it, um, does that represent just US merchant marine ships or were those other nations as well? I believe those were allied ships. I'd have to check the map. I just kind of threw that in there at the last minute because I thought it was an interesting, an interesting map. But I, uh, let's see. I mean, I can if he if he's curious. It's in a it's a, in a book called uh, um, it's in Samuel Elliot, Elliot Morrison's history of the of the the war. Uh, he's a famous naval historian, and his his stuff is. But it's that that's where it comes from. I believe it is all Allied ships, but I'm not I'm not certain. Okay. Margaret says, "Wonderful program." And she just also wants to let you know that she lives in Quincy and worked in the dorm building of the old sailors Snug Harbor, which housed oh. many merchant marines from World War II, hence her interest in this topic. Well, that's very interesting. I, uh, I was at a, a conference of retired for retired merchant marine veterans, and there were some representatives of, uh, of Snug Harbor there of course snug harbor it's not where it was but it's still they still they still apparently do the work they just don't have a they, you know they moved out of snug harbor and they've moved i think from from sea level north carolina so they uh, now they just sort of do it around but but yeah that's very interesting i was re i read a little uh, a short book about snug harbor while i was there that a, that a guy gave me and i thought it was really interesting oh great great Tony wants to know if you have a favorite character from all the people you researched. And he says, thank you also for a wonderful presentation. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, the, uh, I have like a, uh, I, I guess the, uh, I do like that, that I like the British trawler captain in the, you know, on the, on the Arctic, on the Mermaid's run. But for the, Amer the Americans, I like the a couple of members of the Hodges family. I, I like uh, um, Captain Dewey Hodges, who was the owner of the, you know, just a, a great guy, a wonderful captain. And he was, the, unfortunately, the owner of the ring that I showed you the, uh, the, uh, the slide of that was, uh, was found in the, the, in the possession of the, of the shark. And uh, his father, uh, Captain Jesse Hodges, an old tugboat man who was the patriarch of, of the Hodges family. They had uh, seven brothers, all who became merchant captains. And Captain Jesse was this tough old SOB that was the, that was the, the patriarch of the family and drove these guys and you know, everybody just to, to distraction. So, and his, his wife is a very interesting character too. I have a... Uh, the first book, The Matthews Men, is uh, explores not just the you know the stuff at sea, but this this little Matthews County, which is this little tiny, tight knit little outpost in on the coast of Virginia that is just so isolated that it's always been a a cradle for merchant mariners. It's on the water, so that's where everybody goes to. So anyway, it's it's the there are a lot of characters in Matthews that I really like but Captain Jesse he's not necessarily a very appealing character but he's he's just fascinating and his and his wife um Henny who is a, a very important character in the in the first book she is the she's like in the center of the storm when everybody is getting uh, being killed and and having these hair raising escapes a lot of the stories there were so many hair raising escapes you know some of these guys had these incredible stories. And I, uh, 
you know, I, you, you kind of, but they're, you, when you first hear them, you think, well, I don't know about that. But then they're, you know, they're in all the reports. They're the, the Navy report. This is, this actually happened. And it's just amazing what some of these guys went through, not just once, but and they'd go right back out, you know, on another ship and they go through the same waters. They didn't, weren't any better protected than the last time. And boom, they get, they get torpedoed again. I, I forgot to mention one thing that, that U boat that torpedoed the Thomas McKean is, preserved and in uh, on display in Chicago at the Museum of Science and Industry. If you go there, you can walk through the whole U-boat from bow to stern and, and it's, it's very interesting. Anyway. I would, that would be an interesting sort of trip through time. Um, and, you know, and I think what the other thing that you just mentioned that is sort of amazing is, and I guess it's in the Matthews Men book is, is the return to sea of some of these mariners that were torpedoed and attacked and were rescued. Um, what do you think motivates that? Well, it was, uh, they, under the, if, if they sailed as merchant mariners, they saved, sailed merchant ships. And we desperately needed people to do that. We needed that, you know, more than we needed anything. If you, if you could do that and you kept doing that, you were, you were exempt from the draft. And a lot of these guys, you know, they weren't afraid, obviously they were going out at sea, but they didn't really want to be in a foxhole. They wanted to, you know, if they were going to serve their country, they wanted to be out doing what they knew how to do in a place that they, you know, they didn't want to be in a foxhole somewhere. So if they didn't, if, if a guy finished a crew, finished a voyage because you were, if you're a merchant seaman, you can sign on for one voyage and then quit the ship and join another ship. And, you know, you can just change ships constantly all the time. And uh, they, if they, if they signed on to a, they were I'm trying to remember what you were, if they, a lot of them would, would sign on to voyages in different, uh, tell me again, I'm sorry, I've lost the, I'm trying to remember where I went with the. It was, I think what was incredible about some of these mariners was the fact that they, they kept going to sea even after their ships were. Oh yes, I'm sorry. They, and they had to, uh, if they, if they uh, got back from a voyage, they had 30 days to get on another ship. And if they didn't do it, they became eligible for the draft. Uh, and they had to keep going back out. They got certain breaks if they were uh, if they were um, injured, you know, if they could demonstrate that they were injured or, or in rough shape or suffering. But they they really, in a sense, they had to keep going out. But at some point, it would have been easier. You know, a lot of them could have got jobs in the in the shipyards, which were also exempt from from that. But they a lot of them they wanted to be at sea if they were going to fight the war. Well, it is, it's an incredible, it's an incredible story. And um, we do thank the Merchant Mariners for everything that they they did and that they're continuing to do. They're certainly at the forefront of uh, news today um, with the supply chain and all that good stuff. Huh? Um, so I think we're just running up against time, Bill. So I want to thank you again for um, joining us tonight in appreciation um, of your presentation, we are going to send you this Chatham Marconi Maritime hat. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I like we will it. also give you a membership to Chatham Marconi Maritime Center. So on your next trip to the Cape next summer, um, please be sure to uh, come and uh, see us. Uh, we I will. would certainly welcome your, your visit. I will. Um, and to our viewing audience, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, our next program is on January 6th, and we're going to feature Captain Bob Carmichael, who's the commanding officer of the Naval Computer excuse me, and telecommu Telecommunications Area in the Atlantic region. And he'll discuss the history and current state of Naval Communications. So as we draw this year to close 2021, we were so pleased to be open in the museum um, to continue to present our speaker series and would like to thank our audience, whether you're a volunteer, participated as a viewer, came to the museum, you made it a great year and we're looking forward to 2022. Thanks and have a great night. Thank you all.